Uh, it's very uh, nice to, um, to be a part of today's event. In fact, I, I largely came over from Toronto because I'm a great fan of Neil Lawson's and what they're doing with Compass, and this is the second year of Change How. And it turns out that in Canada, you know, we are 100 days away from our next general election come July. So I'm basically here on a reconnaissance mission. Uh, and it was just especially kind that while I was here, they said, well, why don't you take the stage? Um, however, in the interest of, you know, busting up some false advertising in the program, it is it kind of, it's, it's way too grandiose uh, to claim that I'm any sort of world expert in democracy and public engagement. That is far too high a bar to try and leap over, especially in this crowd. Um, at best, I'm a Canadian semi-expert, which definitely sounds like quite the come down. Um, in fact, it reminds me a uh, number of years that a bunch of press editors held a competition for what would be the world's most boring headline. And the winning answer was, worthwhile Canadian initiative announced. <laughs> so I'm afraid I'm going to talk to you about some very worthwhile Canadian initiatives uh, that I've been a part of, actually, over the course of the past decade. And I think it's actually a surprising and I hope you'll find heartening story of participatory democracy and action that really came out of the blue. And over the course of this past decade, well, myself and others have worked very hard to take something that is nominally innovative and try and make it as everyday and as embedded and frankly, as boring as we possibly can. So I'm gonna take you back then to 2002 and four, when there was a lot of pressure building up in our uh, provincial uh, governments to change the electoral system for all the reasons that in the UK you want to change your electoral system as well. And if it had been probably just five or ten years before, they would have done what us good Commonwealth countries do. We would have appointed a royal commission and the great and the good would have gone out and they would have investigated this, this and they would have brought back a report. And instead in British Columbia, our westernmost province, the government of the day decided to appoint what was called a citizen's assembly. And if you can believe it, they sent out 100,000 letters to randomly selected households asking people if they would be prepared to give up 16 weekends over the course of a year to travel from all points in a very large province to Vancouver uh, to gather at something that had been purpose-built called the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University and work their way through an intensively deliberative process and ultimately produce a recommendation for change. And a couple years later, Ontario got that same bug. Uh, and it, too, announced a citizens' assembly. And this time, it was going to be just 12 weekends over the course of almost a year. And the remarkable thing is that when they sent out these 100,000 letters, at a time when we think that people are too apathetic or disengaged and not all that interested in politics, thank you very much, 7,000 people in Ontario volunteered. This is extraordinary. And long story short, we still have the same electoral system that we did before these processes, even though they recommended change and even though we went through a series of referenda. But the heartening piece of this isn't just the story of electoral reform, it was the story of democratic innovation that le led to the citizens' assemblies themselves. Now, I ended up being attached to the Secretariat in Ontario, and I was initially very skeptical for all the reasons that I think most people might be looking in. Well, the folks who put up their hand, they were all the joiners, they were all the keen ears. Were they truly representative? What exactly was going on? Wasn't this some sort of left coast political gimmick that we were just importing? But instead, walking into the Citizens Assembly, actually it's like walking into, well, a bit of a wormhole and arriving in a very different kind of political space. It was a different kind of political space that upends so many of our assumptions about this phantom public, right? This thing that continually haunts our everyday politics and seems so emotional and volatile and polarized. So the story that I really want to tell is a story um, uh, that we sometimes forget because we know the story about people feeling apathetic and disengaged and we know the difficulty of bridging with parties and with elected politicians. But we rarely tell the story of what it must be like to be a public servant on the other side of this. Because after all, they're the ones who usually get to carry the can and actually hold all of these public consultations that do seem so futile and frustrating. The inevitable town hall that gets convened only once decisions have been made and one microphone's put at the middle of the room and people get up and they just harangue. 
Browers, and the usual suspects are there, and it's not broadly representative. And so we end up creating this dynamic where the assumption within the public sector, even though it may be intensely well-meaning, is one that is conditioned to view this phantom public as a risk, right? And so like the best instincts of good public servants come to the fore, risk management, right? So we put up bumpers and barriers and we, we try and control what questions we'll ask, how we'll ask people, all of these sorts of things. So the big question for us in Canada was how do we take the learnings of the Citizens' Assembly and try and make it something that we can do every day? To try, as we say at my little shop, um, how do we try and reinvent public consultation? Our answer to that question has been to create what we now call citizen reference panels. And what I can report to you um, some eight years later is at this point we've now mailed more than a quarter million Canadian households. And we've now held this year our 30th reference panel. And we will have had our thousandth Canadian citizen volunteer not to give us 16 Saturdays of their time, but typically four, five, six. And over this time, we've been investigating all of those complex issues that aren't well served by 90-minute sessions with a microphone where people are going crazy, both on stage and in the audience, because it's just a design problem, right? I mean, just as a quick digression, I've always wanted to get maybe a GP or a nurse to actually stand beside the people at the mic, right, with a heart rate monitor or some neural probes, and to just watch what's actually happening to their, their heart rate and the hormones and are surging. And, and it's kind of comical, right? To poke fun at those people who seem to be like losing their minds publicly. But I actually think it's incredibly cruel. That's not a fair way to invite citizens to express what are probably quite sincere concerns. We need to give ourselves all more time. And so that's the sort of surprising thing. That when it seems impossible to get people to participate for 90 minutes in something, uh, we find a much higher rate of success asking them to give us days and days of their time. Why? Because we're framing everyday democracy not as people just getting to sound off and have their say, but creating meaningful opportunities for public service. So over the course of these seven or eight years, we've investigated everything from the community consent protocols governing supervised injection sites for heroin, to investigating the funding mechanisms for Toronto's version of Crossrail, uh, to thinking about what our health spending priorities might be, and this spring developing a national action plan on mental health for the Mental Health Commission of Canada. The great thing to report to you is not that citizen juries, right, um, are all that special, right, or all that novel, but that they just work, and they keep working. Because the motivations of people who then raise their hand and decide to answer one of these letters calling them to serve varies. I hear folks arriving saying, well, actually, you know, it's just my wife. She wanted to get me out of the house for a few days, so she signed me up. I hope you don't mind that I'm here. Okay, we'll take that. That's fine. Someone else will say when we're doing something on public transit, well, you know, my dad, he worked with locomotives or something, and I don't know anything about it, so I'm here. Someone else will say, actually, I care passionately about this topic, and I've got some strong views. Remarkably, when we randomly select these groups of just 36 people, uh, we only select for three criteria. Gender, half men, half women. So we get the 50-50 parliament effect right away. And that's laudable. Um, we select for age, we match the demographic cohort of the community in which we're working, and we select for geography. And remarkably, those three things, for better or for worse, are actually a really good proxy for the other things we might care about, like income and education and ethnicity. And so we found that just by asking for those three criteria, we end up with these groups, these reference panels, uh, that are incredibly representative of their communities. But one of the things, and it's the point on which I'll close, that I sort of um, always enjoy most when we bring these groups together. Because, of course, the entire time, myself and my team, we wrap ourselves around them. Our job is to scaffold the process and their experience. We staff them as though they were an elected official, and we try and privilege and esteem the process so that it is as absolutely memorable and powerful as it can possibly be. And you can imagine the excitement. People have gotten this phone call and we said, congratulations, it's maybe not the 
we call it the Lotto 649, but you've just won four Saturdays to talk about health policy or what have you. And you know, if you tell people to be excited about these things, they actually get excited about them, right? And so they arrive, and like, you know, folks on the first day of school, they've probably chosen something, you know, kind of proper to wear. And they've arrived a little bit early, and everyone's anxious, and everyone's excited. And we thank them. We thank them for putting their lives on hold, for working on behalf of others, um, for trying to do the very messy, complex work of, of policy making. And then I look at them, and I say, but I don't actually care what you think. And everyone goes, what do you mean you don't care what we think? That's why we're here. And the important point about all of this is that the real act of democratic citizenship, of course, isn't just telling people what you think and what you want. Democracy, at its best, is an empathic form of government. And that means that the role of citizenship is to try and find those spaces where we get to put ourselves in one another's shoes. And that's the challenge we put in front of our modest 36 that there were another 500 people who would have happily taken their seat and were waiting just outside that figurative door to do so. And their job is, in an empathic way, to make that leap of imagination, to understand the needs of strangers and to put themselves in other people's shoes. Long story short, they spend their time together. Half of it is spent actually learning um, all kinds of different perspectives. We bring in some of the top experts in any field. We bring in people who are directly experienced uh, with whatever issue on which we're deliberating. They write the report, which are typically 20, 30 pages, a very detailed guidance to government. And there's no voting that goes on. There are no post-it notes. There's just no stickies. There's nothing special except for people taking quite seriously the task before them. You know, at the end, we give people, and you think, well, it's just four Saturdays. What, it, what of it? We, um, we've learned to, to produce, uh, because I take huge advantage of government typography and logo types, like I got a folder on my laptop that's every possible government logo in Canada, and we use them quite liberally. <laughs> because we want to, of course, convey, right, the seriousness of this enterprise. We produce these certificates at the end, and they say a certificate of public service, and we hand them out to people. And the remarkable thing is, these are only like, you know, pound store frames. And, you know, it came off a little laser jet. And yet every few months, somebody calls us and says, I had it hung up in my living room or in the rec room or something, and it fell off the wall. Would you print me another? And you think, really? <laughs> you know, that cost a pound. And we send them out happily, right? Because it's easy for us to forget when we're coming to events like this one and people are generously handing us the mic, um, that actually, for so many people, this will be their one and only most direct and meaningful experience of people actually caring about what they think, taking them seriously enough to serve and to work to represent the views of others. Thanks.